that border on large centers, it is sometimes difficult to get a sense of history. Rapid change has a way of blurring the past, masking it with the modern. I'm in the town of Markham, Ontario. It was formed in recent years as an amalgamation of a number of small communities on the city of Toronto's urban fringe. What we're going to do here is look at the parts that make up the whole. And I think you'll find, as I have, that that small town feeling that's in many of us doesn't readily disappear. So, from checkerboard champions to adventures along the side roads, here is a glimpse into an era that was. Daybreak in one of Canada's leading corporate head office and high-tech industry municipalities. A side of town that many don't expect to see. It's this side of town that ties the place to its roots. Formerly a township, Markham has been a refuge over the years to many who have come in search of the values that smaller, less urbanized municipalities offer. While a majority of the locals work in the area, there are those who follow the commuter ritual, traveling to and from Toronto's downtown core. Few of today's passengers stop to think that once, a trip to the city was a long planned for event. A sixth generation descendant of one of the area's first families, history and tradition are the forte of John Lunau. Well, that was the first railway that came up through. It started uh, at Scarborough, went up as far as Kobe Conk, Ontario. Oh, wow. And the great old whiskey distiller in Toronto, William Goodrum, put a great share of the money up to get this track laid, that he could take the grain, draw the grain from all these townships out here for into his Goodrum and Works uh, whiskey distillery. And oh, that's oh, how yes. the old... Uh, uh, the old line started, and the Unionville Station and Markham are the original stations, 1870. For those who choose to be less citified, there is much of Markham that is comfortably down home. Many of the local hangouts are steeped in an atmosphere of keeping in touch. A typical morning is when retired farm worker Roy Mustard comes into Joe's Barber Shop. Roy is one of the few who can tell first-hand stories of digging wells and stooking grain by hand. For him, a straight razor shave is still a part of day-to-day -day convention. Of the separate hamlets within the town, the village of Markham, Millican Mills, Buttonville, Victoria Square, Unionville is one entity. Public pressure has worked in favor of preserving this vestige of a century past. It serves as a visible reminder of the efforts of Markham Township pioneers who traced the Dawn and Rouge River Valleys in search of a foothold to settlement. North of Main Street in Unionville is a tribute to William Mole Bercy, 
Much maligned in history, the man was a dreamer, a writer, painter, architect, free thinker. In 1794, Bercy led 64 German families here by way of the Genesee Valley in Upper New York State. Fronting on the northern border of then Scarborough Township, the terrain, part of the Lake Ontario watershed, was fertile. And under the plow of tenacious colonists, Markham was destined to become a grain and dairy Garden of Eden. After the Germans came here, I assume they were Lutherans, then you had Mennonites move into this area, didn't you? Yeah, say, the Mennonites came up in <clears throat> the first one, the Reverend Henry Wybman came in in 1803 uh, from uh, uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And they came up here and surveyed the land. There was a lot of huge, big walnut trees growing in Markham Township, and virgin pine, they called it. And uh, they studied the land, and they went back home to Pennsylvania. And in 1804, there was a large immigration of, of Weidmans and the Hoovers and uh, Smiths and uh, Burke holders uh, and Reesers. A little story, Harvey, the Cedar Grove Post Office, which is on the 10th concession of Markham, it used to be there, I should say. At one time, there was 28 different Reeser families got mail there. <laughs> so if it was Christmas time and a card came, Mr. Reeser, poor old postmaster had a hell of a job to <laughs> A town landmark. Operating within the family for five generations, Reeser's Marmill continues to supply customers in the region with dairy feeds. The operation remains much unchanged since the days of the team and wagon. And like a tapestry, within the town's 213 square kilometer landscape, there are many once autonomous smaller places that offer an array of names. The original name of Box Grove was Sparta. And when they applied for a post office, they found that there was another Sparta outside of St. Thomas, Ontario. So they named the little community Box Grove with the type of a tree that grew down there that they made wooden boxes out of it, but they called it boxwood. And that is how Box Grove, well then Cedar Grove, was named after the, Men or the Mennonite people named it. There was a lot of large stands of cedar trees, so that gave it that name. You come to Dollar, Ontario. Yeah, that's, that's the one I wanted to ask you about. It was one that always had me beat, and I always you know, Where the name came from. Where the name came from. And I always uh, stated that there was four people named Quarter that lived around the area, and they named the place Dollar. And I got away with it for many years. Uh, I think maybe there was a Lord Dollar who low... Uh, well, I like the four quarters story better. Yeah, well, that's right. They, a little bit of humor there, you know. Were there ever rail cars made here? There was a, what was it, the Spate Company? Mm -hmm. What that was was the Spate wagon company, a company that started here in 1830 that made uh, wagons and buggies and cutters. They even made baby carriages. But in, in 1886, they made quite a number of horse-drawn streetcars for the Toronto Street Railway. This firm employed 125 local men in that early time, and when the motor car age came in, why, uh, they didn't change over to making cars, and they went completely out of business. And another thing I should tell you is that Markham has the honor of the first registered Clydesdale stallion that came to Canada from dear okay. old Scotland in 1841. And the big horse was called Gray Clyde. Well, did they use him for stud or? Uh, yeah, the there's a great story 
on this horse that it went to the provincial exhibition, which was the forerunner of the Canadian National mm -hmm. Exhibition, and it had 15 of its offsprings marching behind it. <laughs> uh, and the papers gave it a big, uh, big write-up many, many years ago. It's a great, great story with the offspring. Talk about champions. Over there is a handmade, hand-painted checkerboard. Now that leads me to a checker champion. William Fleming? Yes. Wasn't he the world, <clears throat> world champion? Yeah. North American champion. North American champion, Harvey. William Fleming was born in Scarborough Township, and uh, he was a uh, checker champion from 1868 until 1890. He played checkers and would have challenges. There was a chap in Winnipeg named Kelly, and they'd bet $100 a side. Winner take all, and he would go to Winnipeg, and and then Kelly came to Markham. So the <laughs> Markham Township and Scarborough Township in the hundred years ago or more were great. It was a great sport playing checkers, mm -hmm. and uh, in the in the Presbyterian Church Cemetery in in Old Markham Village is a full size checkerboard on his tombstone. Oh. And some 45 years ago, in the write-up when we were boys, Harvey, we looked at it every week or every day, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Oh, yes. And it was in there and a story that it was the only tombstone in North America that had a, a checkerboard on it. You told me a story before about Sir John A. Macdonald coming here on some sort of a political rally and, and being held up or something? Delayed. Dear old fellow Peter Reeser, who was born in the year of Confederation, recalled that uh, Sir John A. came in <clears throat> in 1877 for a large political meeting on Markham Fairgrounds. And they took him by horse and carriage from the Toronto Nipissing Railway line and station in Markham and took him to the fairgrounds where there was several thousand people. But while he was down there and all the Tories were busy and happy the old gentleman was here, the Grits jacked up his railway car and lifted it off the rails and <laughs> set it down. And when they came up to take him back to dear old York, or well, it would be Tron in those days, they couldn't get the car going. So uh, Grandpa Reeser always chuckled about that. He, uh, he was 10 year old when it happened. but. Uh, Political dirty tricks of the times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot more fun than now. Well, that's true. The town of Markham is prolific in stories of village and rural life. The region once was the inspirational background for a noon hour radio drama series. Writer Dean Hughes, now deceased, invented the fictitious Craig family and entertained audiences for nearly three decades. Lynn Hughes. Well, in 1939, the CBC decided to have a farm broadcast to help farmers to upgrade their farming because nothing had been changed for 40 or 50 years. It was really back about the same pace that they were in World War Number One. And CBC felt that they could be of service to the farmers. So this show was, particularly the Craigs, was for better methods of farming, to propagate better methods of farming and educate the farmers. But it was sugar-coated by the Craigs, which was a cereal and a lot of humor in it. I figure they should allow a fellow about $25 for the time he spends making these things out. Oh, my land, if they allowed for everything like that, they'd be owing you money. Well, sure, I can't think of anything I'd like better. That'd be sort of a cash crop every year, eh? The voices of the principals, Frank Petty, Grace Webster, Alice Wright, and George Murray, brought the Craigs into the hearts and homes of thousands. On the air five days a week until 1965, the trials and plain folk humor that issued from Hughes' typewriter 
was harvested from real life experiences of his neighbors, combined with the ripening melodrama of their own Briarwood farm. When we came here, Unionville was very small. They were local people who had been here since the turn of the century, pretty much. There were no city people out here. They were natives of long standing. A very quiet place. And at first, I think we were hardly accepted because we were city folk. An art college graduate, Lynn would take on a new career of farming while Dean wrote and commuted along the gravel roads to Toronto. Unknowingly becoming a model for a Craig family member, farmhand King Snowball, seen here on the left, introduced his apprentice to life on the land. We learned the hard way. King was the boss. He was uh, a farmer from two or three generations, a well-known family in the area, the Snowball family. So King and I ran the farm, literally. I worked the barns, the field, the house, and uh, enjoyed every minute of it. As farmers do, they exchange help from one farm to the other. So luckily, I would have a big farm be when we were filling a silo or harvesting, thrashing. And I'd have 14 men come for dinner at noon. They'd be working out in the field, and I had to be prepared for it. I'd start at 5 o'clock in the morning baking pies, and so I got acquainted with, with them, and I think they gradually began to accept me. The Craigs were ordinary people struggling through daily misadventures, the outcome of which became experiences to draw on. Hugh's genius made them believable to his listeners, while at home, fact and fiction would sometimes collide. His imagination and, and the, the color that he got into the, the program when the farmers listened to it, they hadn't had much experience with radio, and, and he was such a good writer that they really thought it was happening. At one point, we had the whole cast out to the farm. We had a picnic for them. We thought this would be nice to have them right out here on the farm. They hadn't seen the farm. Um, King said, well, I want to get into conversation with Frank. He knows so much about sheep, but then, King was judging from what he heard on the radio that Frank really knew his Shropshire sheep. So he talked to Frank about sheep, about sheep. Frank had never seen a sheep in his life. I mean, he came from Edinburgh, Scotland. He was a Scotsman. He'd always lived in the city, and he was a lawyer by trade, but sheep. So after the party had gone and we were having dinner, dinner at night, King was, he says, I, he says, that Frank Petty, he doesn't know one single thing about sheep. He said, what's he talk like that on the air for when he doesn't know anything about them? He, he was, he really thought it was happening. He really thought all these people on the craigs knew what they were talking about. Inheritance. Within the shadow of Toronto's skyline, Markham is forever reminded that the fortunes of the farm are interwoven into its evolving history people tell that story. When he was a young man, Wilbur Slat Latimer, who is now 93, lived a much different way of life. You know, in those days, people weren't moving in and moving out. There were fixtures. In fact, I've, I've witnessed practically the whole of Unionville die off because they stayed there, lived there, till they died. And I could go down the street and and uh, I knew every house, and you'd come down just below the, the, the entrance to the pond, now the south entrance, and you'd begin to hear the water at the dam, the roar of the dam, you know. It was, uh, to, to, to my ears, it was music, because I liked playing around the old pond. I paddled rafts around there and paddled canoes around, as I said before, trapped muskrats, skated and swam, and, Played hooky in school. Well, then when you cross the bridge, there's a gristmill going, boom, 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 you know. And you went to, up the sidewalk and down the street, and there was a blacksmith shop, which was the main going shop at that time. I'm talking when I was seven or eight years old, you see. And so down south of that was Art Brown's store, and across the street from him was. Padgett and Hayes Hardware Store. 
And then they come down past the factory and there's the railway train and there's the station. You hung around there quite a bit, you know. They were all, all sounds, musical sounds, you know, going machinery. <laughs> The day is winding down. Coming home along the rail line that once, in addition to passengers, carried the mail, milk cans, barley, has traditionally been likened to traveling the Mariposa Special, a time machine moving somewhere between nostalgia and reality. The activities and aura of Slot Latimer's days earlier this century echo through the community, preserving that era that was for some in the town of Markham, is a priority. I have tried to carry the flag uh, for the old community that way. The people of Unionville have done a tremendous job to preserve that old village. Mm -hmm. Today, it's come into its own, where people are coming yeah. for miles to visit. Uh, and uh, we can't get rid of everything, you know what I mean. There have been many who have quietly, in their own way, contributed significantly to what is here. Building on that is now the present generation's responsibility. Tomorrow's child, reason enough to carefully contemplate our decisions today. Most of the older people have gone. There's not the same feeling, but the people who come out here, they think they will get the feeling of living in a little village, and they think that this could be paradise. I think they're getting a bit of the feeling that we had way back, that the comfort of being close to a community that might care. Whenever I go, whenever I do that place, I know. It'll always be home, home to you.